Pierre Nelson. Um, Hi, this is Midori Friedbauer. We are recording our presentation Anticipating Marginalized Students for the 2020 FAXIS Conference. Um, and for this recording, we wanted to start off, because we're not visually coding in the same way, with a short positionality statement from each of us. Um, so I am white, um, I'm also trans, and I have mental health conditions, and I also don't have a lot of money. And I think those are all very relevant to the theory and experiences that I've presented in this presentation. My positional positionality statement, uh, Midori here, um, I am African American, I am queer, um, I I'm an undergraduate at the University of Washington studying communication with a minor in diversity and English. Um, I am a survivor of many types of trauma and I grew up in Eastern Washington in a predominantly white community as an African American. And so I'm bringing in multiple histories uh, and cultures and um, positionalities all at once and those have affected my experiences in classrooms and those experiences have informed this lecture. Um, alrighty, so our presentation we structured in kind of two halves. So the first half is just about reframing this idea of accessibility um, and Reframing student needs. Um, so, in our experiences and in the conversations that originally kind of prompted this presentation, we discuss how classroom accessibility is often treated as a to do list or a script where, okay, student X has issue Y with, and that has solution Z. Um, so, even professors which kind of, who kind of pride themselves on making their classrooms accessible or implementing educational theory will often take this approach where, okay, check, 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 this classroom is now universally accessible. Um, and one of the main obstacles that this idea of accessibility has posed to me, and I think Dory as well, is that there are so many needs that are, just don't make that list of needs that are conceived of in the academy. There are a lot of needs that aren't addressed by DRS um, or other kind of medical diagnostic models of access needs. Um, and there are particularly needs that people pick up as people moving through the world experiencing trauma. And um, that script completely excludes all those needs. So this also is and institutionally motivated is not just a misunderstanding of students, but it happens when professors want something neat and short, this, you know, something that they feel that they can access and be knowledgeable about and just check off instead of continue to ponder throughout their careers. Um, so to address this, we want to propose a critical approach to student needs and part of that critical approach is going to be in the end a list of policies that you might implement in your classroom if you're a professor or a TA or a person who is teaching. Um, but we wanted you to first think about that list not as a solution to accessibility but as a, the start of a conversation. Um, a really important part of how we think about this accessibility might be what students, when you're designing your classroom and you're designing your syllabus, what students are you anticipating? What knowledge are you anticipating? And why are you anticipating that? And that really moves us into this idea of that accessibility isn't really about individual students having flaws that prevent them from accessing classrooms. It's more about this system of university and these classrooms that have been set up over a long period of time and also this discipline of education and pedagogy which has been set up over a long period of time to 
keep certain groups in certain positions, um, keep certain groups in power, and keep certain groups from accessing power. And we obviously need to challenge that. Um, challenging that will give you a lot of benefits in your classroom, um, but you, you need that requires active and continual work from you. So obviously many scholars who are very successful in their fields could not produce their best work in the places we are setting up. Um, that's just a fact, and that is present in physics labs that are three hours and don't have time for rest or food or drink and don't allow any food or drink in their labs. And that's also present in English classrooms, um, where work is over-assigned or readings are over-assigned or many other things can make an English classroom very inaccessible. Um, I wanted to also give an example of a way that accessibility is checked off that it needs to be challenged more, and that's with my experience as a trans student in the university. Um, the University of Washington has set up a system of identity.uw where a student can enter a preferred name that is different from the legal name that shows up on university paperwork, and then that preferred name is distributed to mainly professors, and I think some... I don't actually know who else. Um, <laughs> it's not just for trans students, there are lots of people who use that system for different reasons, but it is kind of seen as a check mark next to the presence of trans students. Um, and one way in which that becomes challenging is that there's a certain vision of the trans student who can use that system. In particular, the system doesn't take the pronouns of trans students. So when you walk into a classroom, you're still being put at risk, and that's actually resulted for me and a lot of microaggressions from professors who looked at me and were like, is this a typo? You're Willow, right? Who have um, gotten access to my older name that I don't use anymore and gotten very confused about which name to use in different contexts. And there's been quarters where I wished that I could selectively, you know, inform one professor and not some others about what my preferred name was. When I tried that, I was told it's hard to remember. I've gotten tests back in one such classroom where I did not officially change it in the system, where despite my having communicated beforehand with the TA and the professor about what name I was going to use, I got a test back where my name was crossed out and replaced with the one I don't use anymore. Um, and this just speaks to the way that the system is set up to affirm gender, affirm the gender specifically of a student who is a binary trans person whose pronouns are obvious and who just wants a little pat on the head, them to be told like, yes, we accept you, your gender is affirmed by the system. It's a very medical idea, um, but it doesn't necessarily address the experiences of students who are navigating bureaucracy and administration, which is not always friendly to them. Um, and it doesn't really address like the lived experience of walking into a classroom as a trans student. Um, so that's one place where a professor who is thinking about accessibility critically is going to be really flexible to what the student needs and be part of that ongoing conversation. Um, the last, the last point, the last slide, I guess. Um, we've talked about how accessibility is not about individual students. It's about a university system built to consolidate power among certain groups. Um, related to that, there's this fact that needs aren't optional. Um, if a student does walk in with an ex access need, again, it's not on them. It's also like they're paying to be here and they're doing emotional, intellectual labor that's not graded and that's not paid. And the least you can do is hear them um, and participate in that conversation and give them what they need um, to access education. Um, bonus, your classroom will be better when you do. Um, if you're assigning readings that are dealing with concepts that you know could be a trigger to a student and you don't give a content warning, you are probably barring that student from speaking. And in doing so, you're eliminating a really important voice from your classroom that could probably add more to the conversation than the voices that are left when you 
don't. Um, if that makes grammatical sense. And um, <laughs> if you include that content warning and give some alternatives, then you're guaranteeing yourself a better informed class discussion. So that's one example where you obviously want to do that. But again, I hope that that's a bonus and not the only motivating factor for treating students as people. Um. Sensibility. The institution of higher learning is inherently colonial, inherently racist, and inherently violent for people of color, survivors of institutional and systemic violence, and to people with diverse abilities. Too many classrooms become microcosms of oppression where trauma is reproduced by professors and instructors who are not who are not teaching as if the material in the syllabus directly affects the physical, mental, and spiritual health of their students. Frequently, classroom policies echo the same bigotry that course content attempts to critique. A lack of self-awareness permeates pedagogy which leads directly to the reproduction of discriminatory practices that cause systemic violence that makes it difficult for students to enter college classrooms. If you want to make space for students, you need to change the space. You need to change your syllabus, and you need to think about how your presence in the classroom is helping or harming students. I will explain how college is inherently violent, how classrooms reproduce structural and systemic violence, and how a few classroom policies can start to move toward minimizing harm for students of color, survivors of trauma, and students with diverse abilities. Number one, college is inherently colonial, racist, and violent. In the United States and many other places in the world, institutions of higher education are built on stolen, occupied lands with wealth accumulated through the exploitation of people of color. Many colleges and universities bear the names of racists, slaveholders, misogynists, and officers of wars that affect the students in your classrooms and their families. Essentially, universities and colleges are institutions imported from Europe for and by the rich to accumulate capital within groups of preferred and approved people who could be selected to attend the schools and weeded out by arbitrary standards set by the school. Students today are told that their future employment opportunities and therefore their ability to survive and support their families entirely depends on academic success, especially academic success in college. Students of color in particular are fed a narrative that they occupy a lower social position than their peers and the only hope of upward mobility requires they attend college no matter the cost to themselves, their families, or their well-being. Students of color Survivors of systemic violence and people with diverse abilities are asked to sacrifice their money, take on debt, leave their social and emotional safety nets, leave their cultural homes and ways of life, and relocate to an institution that was designed to keep them out at every level. Your classroom is one of those levels designed to keep them out. Their presence in your classroom is coerced by economic stress, social constructs, and capitalist expectations. Many of your students are there not because they want to be, but because if they don't, they may never find a job that will provide enough income for their basic survival. Our society does not guarantee food, shelter, clothing, health care, or child care. And as the cost of living grows, so, do, so too do the economic stresses that force students to participate in the institution of higher education. For these students, academic success is a matter of life and death. I am one of those students forced to be here. I am only here because colonizers committed genocide across what is now called the United States, my ancestors were stolen and enslaved, years of racism and discrimination caused mass migration to the north, a lifetime of poverty and trauma made me eligible for scholarships and government assistance, and my adherence to requests that I write about my trauma for college admittance committees secured those funds. I was told I would never amount to anything unless I went to college. I left behind everything I knew to go to a school I couldn't afford on someone else's money so that the university could pat itself on the back for being so diverse. The diversity of the college is little more than tokenism when I walk underneath the statue of a slaveholder every single day and see only a handful of people who look like me as I walk from class to class. 
In a school of nearly 48,000 students, the UW Seattle campus has less than 2,000 enrolled black students in autumn of 2019. I work 10 hours a week to support myself and save money so I can pay the taxes on my scholarships. I overextend myself with extracurricular activities because I'm told that it is no longer good enough to go to college. I have to simultaneously have an internship, leadership, leadership position, or volunteer for as many hours as I can, encouraging me to labor for free until I have destroyed my body, spirit, and mind. Then I am asked to speak of gratitude for being separated from my community and family, gratitude for education from instructors who re-traumatize me, and gratitude for the opportunity to work 10 times harder than my white peers to make it half as far. Unironically, I am grateful because the alternative to going to college for me would, be, would have been remaining in poverty, supporting my family on the limited income potential I had as only a high school graduate, and staying in a community where I was abused and assaulted. Yes, college and my scholarships have saved me from a worse fate, but I wouldn't need saving it if not for... I would not need saving if not for colonialism, and that colonialism is reproduced in the classrooms which are a slightly lesser evil than the life I had before. Furthermore, my being at college further harms the community I came from, taking their ambitious youth and telling them to participate in the same capitalism that led to the gentrification of their homes. My degree will meet the market's demand for college-educated workers and serve as so-called evidence that anyone can make it in America. The truth is, I wouldn't have made it without the generous, generous donations of billionaires, millionaires, and corporations who have a vested interest in reproducing the inequality that made them so profitable and using scholarship gifts as part of their PR scheme to keep people just hopeful enough that they too may climb the social ladder that people don't riot as their homes are foreclosed and their neighborhoods are bought and sold by real estate developers that don't care about affordable housing. The inequalities that allow universities to exist are sawing through each rung of the ladder of economic and social mobility. Part 2. Classrooms reproduce structural and systemic violence. Over and over again, I am re-traumatized in college classrooms. I am subjected to unmonitored class discussions where classmates say violent and awful things that make me relive past traumas. I am asked to read graphic, horrific descriptions of violence against bodies like mine without content warnings and without follow-up discussion to justify reading the material at all. I have had professors go beyond microaggressions into the territory of justifying bigotry and violence. I have had my various identities and statuses brought up in classroom discussions and discussed as if anyone in my position could not possibly exist in college classrooms. I am asked to provide documentation, expensive doctor's notes, attend hours of consultations, and file paperwork to even begin receiving minor accommodations. Many nights I have encountered violence in these ways and find myself too emotionally distraught to do my assignments until late in the night, several hours after the incidents, and have to forgo sleep to turn in an assignment on time the next day. Frequently, my class syllabi give unfair advantages to already privileged students by not offering the kinds of accommodations that students in my position can take advantage of while offering help to students who have more free time and resources than I do. Often, I spend more time recovering from being in the classroom than I do learning. Part 3. Change your classroom policies. The following policies are not meant to be a checklist but conversation starters about what you can do to improve your classroom and how you can address the issue that students in your classroom are there so that they can earn a piece of paper that gives them access to a means of survival, survival in a capitalist system that is built to exclude them from basic human rights. And so since these students are forced to be in your classroom, these are conversation starters about how you can help them survive. First, no apolitical classrooms. An apolitical classroom reinforces the status quo, which is inherently violent, towards these students. Second, protect students. It is your responsibility as a facilitator of education to make sure that your classroom is safe for all of the students in it. Next, Monitor discussions with authority, and if this isn't possible, set clear guidelines on how students can report problems, set boundaries, 
and get your help if the discussion is becoming violent. Unmonitored discussions are where most of the microaggressions and acts of violence overall have happened in my experience in college. Have specific content warnings with page numbers and justify reading or showing any graphic or disturbing content. You have no idea how graphic or disturbing content may affect each individual in your classroom, and you cannot assume that it is safe to expose students to graphic or disturbing material without giving them a warning that is specific enough that they can skip over that section of the reading to keep themselves and their mental health and their well-being intact. Give alternatives to assignments that may disturb students. It's unfair to require students to potentially do self-harm by exposing themselves to graphic or disturbing content in order to pass your class. Next, give free resources to help students deal with course content not just a syllabus cut and paste that is university-wide, tell students the address of where they can seek crisis counseling on campus, offer flyers for safe campus, counseling resources, Planned Parenthood, or any other services that may be relevant to them. Go out of the way to find out what services are available to the students in your classroom and take it upon yourself to go a little bit further to let your students knew, know that their survival is important to you. Next, post online warnings about subjects the course will cover so that students can decide before signing up whether or not your class is the right one for them before they, can, before they enroll. This saves them the stress of possibly having to reschedule their part-time job if they realize they have to change courses once your day one syllabus discussion takes place and they learn about what course concepts and material are going to be present in your classroom. Attendance policies are frankly unacceptable and anything that grants participation points purely on attendance is inherently violent for any student in a position of lower economic status diverse ability, or a student of color. You have to understand that from the student perspe perspective, in order to get accommodations, it takes unnecessary doctor's appointments that are expensive. It may mean missing work. It may mean putting in hours of meetings and paperwork and scheduling and frustration just to get a minor accommodation to get excused from your class. So you need to put policies in place in your classroom so that students know that if they need to miss class for any reason, it's not going to mean academic failure or have academic consequences for them because students do not need to choose between their well-being and their grade you can make sure that they're safe from having to make decisions like that. Make sure to record your lectures on Panopto if it's a possibility, and if it's not a possibility, please make your slides available online, make your notes available online, take pictures of writing on the board and make it available online. Encourage students to have a shared class study guide and note set online that's accessible to all students so students don't have to worry about whether or not they'll be able to catch up if they become ill and have to miss class or have any other emergency that may mean they miss class. I can tell you from firsthand experience that I have done shared Google um, Doc notes with classes as large as 300 and classes as small as 20 and it works regardless of class size and it has been absolutely life-changing to see the kinds of collaboration that go into a shared class study guide and the learning that can happen without your presence as long as you facilitate the space for students to come together and discuss course concepts in a way that allows them to share the knowledge that is being produced in the classroom and the takeaways and main points of the conversations that are happening. Um, 
in a 300 person lecture just recently, we had a shared study guide that grew to 25 pages long and had over 100 students participating the night before the test. It is an amazing tool to keep your class successful. Next, make as much of your assigned readings as free or inexpensive as possible. Learn about copyright use and how many pages you can scan of a story or a textbook and share without violating it um, for educational purposes. If there is a book that you don't plan on having your class read the entirety of, just scan the chapters that you need to teach from or give a summary of what you learned from the book as part of your lecture. Please save students money because some of them are choosing between textbooks, food, medication, and that's not fair. Next, organize your Canvas files so that students can find documents in a timely manner. Keeping files organized by week makes it less likely a student will miss a reading due to not knowing how to navigate your filing system, and computer literacy is an expectation of the privileged. Make your syllabus available well in advance so students can order their textbooks from more economically accessible sources, meaning cheaper sources. Encourage students to leave the room if they feel uncomfortable with content and assure them that there will be no negative consequences for leaving. Let students know about alternative assignments they can do if they have an access need and encourage them to talk to you if they have any conflicts or problems with assignments. Make field trips optional or give students adequate time to find alternate off-campus activities to do for the assignment. Don't expect students to put your class before their needs, before their work schedules, or before their family. Never reprimand a student for academic performance in front of their classmates. This includes giving feedback where students can hear you, demanding students resubmit a paper in front of peers, or pointing out mistakes you found in turned in assignments in front of the class. If you use a student's work as an example, anonymize the information thoroughly. If you know a student is affected by a subject you are speaking about or think that you know, don't assume and don't stare at them or ask them to talk about their experiences in front of the class. They may not want to open themselves up to negative consequences of sharing those experiences, and if it's and it's not right to assume you are entitled to their input. Also, stop using students to further your own career. You are being paid with their tuition to teach them. They have no obligation to help you learn from the knowledge they produce in your classroom or the background knowledge they bring to the conversation. You are not entitled to hear their feedback. If they want to help you, if they want to share, that is their choice in when and how they do so. Participation can take many forms. Do not require students to come to class to participate and do not require students to speak in front of the class to get participation points whenever possible. Alternatives, ask for a daily reading response. Ask for students to speak to a partner in small groups. Let students write learning reflections. Ask students to post in the discussion board on Canvas. Be creative in your pedagogy and give your students agency and freedom to decide for themselves how they want to share their learning progress with you when it comes to participation points. Thank you.